Hi, this is Dr. Bob Dannenhofer, the Public Health Officer for Douglas County. With another of our Facebook Live events, this is one of my new balaclavas here. They have ear holes. I'm not sure that works particularly well, but I'm going to take it down for people who want to read lips. So again, Dr. Bob Dannenhofer from Douglas County here with Facebook Live tonight on June the 5th. Uh, so as typical, we'll start off with the worldview and then move down to the Douglas County view. The worldview is that this is still really an active pandemic. The last week has shown the most cases per day that we've had, and so it's really still spreading in the rest of the world. We're starting to see uh, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, Peru, and Ecuador really have some of the most active areas in the world. And this is a little concerning because these are equatorial regions, they're in our hemisphere, and because of the travel within the hemisphere, you know, the fear is that this is gonna continue to spread. About half of the active cases are in the Western hemisphere, for the first time ever. Brazil especially is having a really, really tough time of this with lots of cases and lots of deaths, but Peru, Ecuador, Mexico are also struggling. In the rest of the world, we're still seeing lots of cases in Russia, uh, also in India, Iran. So it's a really worrisome worldview that this we are not past this pandemic in the rest of the world. The good news is that in the US, we're kind of stable. Now, we're not, certainly not past it. You know, we started off with no cases, moved up to about 30,000 cases a day, and then moved down to 20,000 cases a day. But we have been really stubbornly at the 20,000 cases a day for about two months now. And that really suggests that we're doing it. Now, some of that is because we're doing more testing, but not much because we still have a positive testing rate of 10 to 12%. And so some of this is because we're doing more tests, but not really. The death rate is coming down a little bit, but still is stubbornly high. The U.S. is now close to 2 million cases, 110,000 deaths, suggesting the case fatality rate is going to be about 5.5%, which is still high. You know, really, you should get down to a case fatality rate of 2 or 3% if you're finding all the cases. So I still don't think we're finding all the cases in the United States. In Oregon, still we're doing really well. We're about fourth lowest attack rate a little over 4,000 cases, which is about 1,000 cases per million. In the rest of the country, it's far higher than that. Douglas County continues to do even better than that. We're at 29 cases. That's an increase of a few cases, and we'll talk about that in the last two weeks, but really a, a fairly minor increase. Uh, two of the patients are hospitalized. One has been a long-term hospitalization, and one is a new hospitalization for whom the test came out positive but not really related to the hospitalization. Uh, and uh, some of the cases have been from in the county, some from out of the county. So generally a, a, a relatively low pace of disease in Douglas County. You may have read that we've moved today into phase two, and this allows a little bit more relaxation of the rules. And I'm sure there'll be questions, so I'll let you ask those questions and I'll answer those. A Couple of other things we wanted to point out. We're beginning to recognize more and more that this disease is unusual. Now in most diseases, you have a disease, you spread it to one or a couple of people, and then that's it. In this disease, it seems that there's some people don't spread it to anyone. Interestingly, kids don't seem to spread it to very many people at all. So although they've opened up schools in China and Korea and in Denmark, there does not seem to be a lot of passing of this between kids, which is really very different from something like flu, really very different from like most common colds, which do tend to spread a lot in kids and less in adults. This one actually tends to spread more in adults and less in kids. And there are some people don't spread it to anyone. So people have the disease, they bring it home, nobody else in their family gets it. And then other people, even before they're symptomatic, can spread it to 20 people. So it's a very confusing disease and it's gonna be a really hard disease to follow because of that. We are working in vaccines. There are 70 vaccines in development. Some of these are ready to enter phase two trials. That means phase one trials showed that they didn't cause any big side effects and did bring up some antibodies. Phase two trials, you get more people, more diverse people, a larger group of people, and you check to be sure both that there's no side effects and that you're gonna make antibodies. So that's starting. There's a new antigen test that's out. An antigen test looks for the protein that's associated with the virus and seems to be a pretty good test these antigen tests are really going to be an advance because they should be easier to do, they should be cheaper overall to do, and they should be able to easily uh, be, be propagated. So a new antigen test would be great. 
And then there's stuff about blood tests. But let me answer the other questions and we'll get back to that. So have, Zach says, have we seen an uptick in cases due to people gathering for protests? And the answer is not yet. But again, think about that. You know, these protests have been going on for maybe eight or nine days. And so that if you were in a protest eight or nine days, got infected on that time, you wouldn't have symptoms until two days ago. And then you would have had to get a test and get the results. So we're just going to start to see the results of the, of the protest cases come up this weekend and early next week. Now in Douglas County, there were not a lot of, uh, there was not a lot of gathering at protests. So it'll be interesting to see in those areas that did have a lot of protests like Minneapolis versus places like Roseburg that didn't have a lot of protests to see if this is gonna be related. On the one hand, there was a lot of gathering, a lot of mixing, a lot of yelling and shouting, all things that, that uh, make a lot of droplets. Now, interestingly, a lot of people were wearing masks Actually, I think there were more people wearing masks in the protests that I see in the grocery store here, and they were outdoors, two things which may decrease the spread. So it'll be really fascinating to see if we have cases that arise out of these protests. Um, so Bobby says, schools are planning an adjusted 20 to 21 school year. Do you think this is needed? If so, is it needed for the entire year? So the first question, are schools gonna open? And I think the answer is yes. I saw some advanced data today suggest that we are really planning for schools to be open in the fall. The good news is that again, this disease does not seem to be really spread lots by kids. Unlike most infectious disease, where kids are little germ magnets, you know, they pick it up and they spread it to others. They don't seem to be such germ magnets for this. So that's a good sign. And uh, kids don't really seem to be super spreaders. So there are no super spreader events that involve kids. And that's a good sign. So I think schools will open. How they'll open, I don't really know. Uh, I was on a long call today, and when I left, I knew no more than when I started, but I think we'll do it. All right, I knew I was gonna get this question. So Donna says, could you explain how blood type A make, may make one more susceptible to COVID? The answer is we don't know. So uh, the blood types are these glycoproteins, which are on the cells, uh, on the surface of your red blood cells. And there's, there's two uh, glycoproteins that are there. There's A and there's B. And so if you have neither A nor B, you have blood type O. If you have both, you have blood type AB. If you have two copies of A or one copy of A, you're an A. And if you have one copy or two copies of B, you're B. And so these glycoproteins could either cause, as this gets in the bloodstream, remember we think what happens is this virus gets in the bloodstream and then damages your endothelial cells. It may be that this virus attaches to one of those glycoproteins and may attach better to A or B or the other. Could be that. It could also be that blood type A is associated with a difference in the way we attack certain viruses. So we don't know. I saw this today. I think it's fascinating. Unfortunately, the one thing you can not change in the world is your blood type. Um, so someone says, now that we're in phase two and we read articles that more people have had the virus and been asymptomatic, will we start testing people without symptoms? So we'll start from the end here. We are testing people without symptoms. Testing people without symptoms, uh, we're testing people without symptoms who want to be tested or in high risk areas. But just general testing of asymptomatic people is really not very useful. So Mercy just finished a study where they tested asymptomatic people who were gonna do surgery, and it was zero positives out of the 773, so zero positives. So we think that symptomatic people are gonna be 10 times more likely than asymptomatic people. We're less than one in 100 of that, so we would think less than one in 1,000 one in 1, asymptomatic people will test positive. So in general, asymptomatic testing isn't suggested. Um, uh, so, when they say suggesting more people have had the virus, that doesn't seem to be the case. So the best way we know about who had the virus is to do antibody studies. And the antibody studies in Oregon suggest a very small fraction of the population has had the virus. So Providence did this study where they looked at people in different areas, and it's about, in southern Oregon, about 1 or 2 percent of the people who have actually even seen the virus. Evergreens did a study, it was less, it was zero, had seen the virus. And when we've done our antibody studies, we've not seen 
any people who were asymptomatic who had an antibody. So I don't think more and more people have had the virus. Now there's some place in the country where I do think lots of people had the virus. For example, in New York, New York we think that 15 or 20 percent, there's some places in Europe where it's maybe 15 percent of people had the virus, but we do not think that's the case in Oregon. So I also want to go through other things, some new, uh, new uh, therapeutics. Uh, again, chloroquine, new study came out again suggesting it's probably not going to be helpful if you have the virus. People said, well, maybe it would be helpful to, to prevent you from getting the disease if you took the chloroquine after you got exposed. And a good study was done and it showed that it didn't really help. It was a very slight difference in acquiring the, the virus, but it wasn't statistically significant and certainly not uh, clinically important. So. It doesn't seem to work for that. The remdesivir does seem to be reasonably good, and I think there's some real hope now that remdesivir in conjunction with another drug will be somewhat helpful, and I think that's good. A new study came out on convalescent plasma that's taking blood from people who've had the disease. That does seem to help a little bit. So uh, Kathy asks, are our last few cases community spread? So some are, so there are two cases we don't know where they came from and we would assume that would be community spread but the other cases that we've had we have a pretty good idea of where they got it from so some are community spread some are related to out of area outbreaks and so there's probably still some community spread around now the problem that we have is that some of the cases we're seeing now are people who are asymptomatic and what you don't know is when they acquire the infection because remember, these PCRs can be positive for weeks or months after you have the disease. So if you're asymptomatic, if I'm symptomatic, have the bad disease and you do it, you can sort of say, well, it started on this day. But when you're asymptomatic, it's really hard to know when it started. So these could be infections back from March that were asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. It'd be pretty hard to remember mild cough symptoms from two months ago and now you're still just finding the RNA in their nose. So we're also gonna, on these last few cases that are asymptomatic, we're also gonna do antibody studies. If the antibody studies are positive, it suggests this was a distant infection. If the antibodies are negative, it would suggest a more recent infection. So um, CF asks, could you tamper down fear and explain that COVID isn't a death sentence? that the 0.2, I don't know, that I usually have other symptoms that complicate. Okay, so let's, let's talk about this. So the story is COVID overall has a relatively low death rate. So when we think of really dangerous things like SARS, where a third of the people got it died, or Ebola, where as much as 50% of the people early on who got it died, or smallpox, where maybe 30% of the people got it died, uh, those are diseases with really high mortality. And those are diseases we really cared a lot about. So even though you know, there's out, an Ebola outbreak with only 100 cases, you hear about it because we worry about it. That's why we put the entire world effort to curing uh, smallpox because it was a terrible disease and actually one of the great uh, developments in, in modern world was we eradicated smallpox in this, in this last century. Now with this, um, the disease is very variable. Again, there are not very many deaths in people in less than 20, except for this inflammatory disease. Between 20 and 60, it's a few in a thousand. So it's not very deadly. However, a few in a thousand is still a lot. You know, we have about a thousand people in each age bracket. And if this moved through, let's say it's three in a thousand between 20 and 60, which I think is about right, so three in a thousand, that would mean that in every high school class, in every uh, group, you'd lose two or three people. That's a lot of people to lose because not very many people die in their 20s, 30s, or 40s. That wouldn't be the end of the world because that would mean that 99% of the people would live, but that would still be a lot of deaths. But once you start to get to be my age, it's three or 4%. Well, I know, I know, I know at least 100 people in their 60s. I don't want to see three or, more, three or four of my friends die and then when you get to be 80 or above, which is where most of the people in their 60s parents are, it has a death rate of about 10%. Now, that still means that 90% of the people get it survive, but that's a really high death rate. That's a lot of deaths, and it's not a death sentence for everybody, but overall, it's a lot of deaths. 
you know, we, we think that if you did nothing and just let this blow through the population, just, just say, you know what, we're, we're just not going to do anything. We're going to let it blow through the population. We think in one year, we would have about a million people over the age of 60 die. That's a lot of people. And we think we'd have about 200,000 people under the age of 60 die. That's a lot of people. And so that's what we're, that's what we're balancing that. You know, are we willing to accept 1.2 million deaths versus probably 200,000 deaths, the difference of about a million deaths, and what are we willing to do with society for that? That is a really, really, really tough calculus. I'm glad I don't have to make the decision, and that's why we hire and elect smart people to help make that decision. And actually, I think they've done a pretty darn good job. I know there are people saying, oh, just let this blow through. If some people die, some people die. You know, us, we on the public health side would say, oh, don't let anyone die. And that's why you have to have somebody with reasonable balance. Um, you know, there are places in the world that have tried to just let it blow through. They're not doing so great. I mean, Brazil is really, really struggling because for months they decided this was a little flu and we're going to let it blow through. That's not so great. I think other countries that have really tried to tamp this down, like Norway and Finland, have really not had a big death toll. Now, they've had an economic toll. Uh, and while we've had an economic toll, that's a really tough balance. But it's not, it's not a nothing. People who say that the overall death rate is going to be less than, the overall infection fatality rate is going to be less than 0.4%, less than 4 in 1,000, there is absolutely no basis for that. And anybody who has that, I would love them to show me a scholarly article that would suggest that we do know places where we do know what the death rate is, right? So we do know the, the Diamond Princess. It was, um, uh, the Diamond Princess was 1.8%. We do know uh, on the aircraft carrier, young, healthy guys, right? You could not find a younger, healthier group than the people on an aircraft carrier and still they had a death. This group down in Antarctica, death rate of a few percent. The Ruby Princess, a death rate of 3%. So anybody who's saying that the infection fatality rate is going to be less than 0.4%, please show me the article. I have yet to see it. Um, so are there still GI symptoms related to COVID has been ruled out? Absolutely not. In fact, what we're seeing is that GI symptoms may be one of the more common symptoms. So actually, a couple of our cases have only had diarrhea and very little cough. So GI symptoms, really important to pay attention to. So does phase two allow for visitors to nursing homes or hospitals? So not to nursing homes yet. Hospitals, they decide on their own. And they've made some little tweaks in the rules about visitors. A couple of reasons about visitors to hospitals. One is they don't want visitors to bring disease into the hospital, which could certainly happen. They don't want uh, visitors to come to the hospital and get it. And if visitors are going to visit somebody who's got COVID, they really need to wear full PPE, and that uses PPE, which is in still, still in short supply. So uh, still not allowing visitors to nursing homes. Hospitals are changing, uh, but it, they're making the rules. So... Uh, Amy says, does phase two allow sweaty people to shower at the gym? It even allows non-sweaty people to shower at the gym. Um, we, we recognize that showers at the gym are really an issue because it's really hard to distance. As I've said before, I swear when I go in and put my stuff in a locker and I put it there because there's nobody else around. And when I get back, the two lockers on each side of me are, are with people there. So it is hard to manage social distancing. Showers are allowed at the gym where there are some some rules about crowding in locker rooms and distancing of showers, but yes, you can shower. And I knew Crystal was going to ask, this is your weekly question, any guys on pool tables? I scoured this for pool tables. There is no guidance, and since there's a good, no guidance, I think they're allowed. Um, but I don't know, and I've been trying to ask all the people about that, so I think with, I think absent guidance, they may be allowed. Uh, but as soon as I know, uh, and I asked today the person who was coming up with this, um, and they didn't know the answer to that either. So family members had a respiratory cold in December that the doctor said was the Douglas County crud. What are the chances that this was COVID? So we're doing these fairly elegant uh, 
uh, genetic variation studies on this virus. So when you look at it, it looks like a family tree. So you see the original virus, and then there were, then there was a European strain and a Chinese strain, and then there were a couple of variations on that. So the cancer institutes that really look at genetic variations to help them better understand cancer are now not working on cancer; they're working on COVID, and they're getting these very elegant studies to show when they show when it showed up. And I think they pretty much think that this came to the U.S. in mid to late January. There are no cases, and I can tell you, people are looking really hard because if you were the guy who was able to show, yep, that, yep, this case in December was COVID, you would get an article in the New England Journal, and nobody's been able to find it. So I think the best date is that this probably came in late January or February. But we know there's a lot of people who are sick who haven't had COVID. I mean, we've done 500 tests on the drive through Half of those have been people have been sick and, you know, having put my swab in their nose, some of these people were pretty darn sick. However, they, they didn't have COVID. And when we screened them with antibodies, they don't have COVID antibodies. So they must have had something. And we don't know what it is. As I said before, there was a very elegant study called the, called the Seattle flu study. And their question was exactly this question you ask. If people in the winter don't have flu, what in the world do they have? And so what they did was they collected viral samples from everybody who was sick with a flu-like illness in Seattle. And what they did find is some of these were COVID, and they were the first people to point out that, wait a minute, COVID was here since late January. So they reported this in late February that, wait a minute, COVID isn't, don't, don't believe that COVID hasn't gotten here till end of February. It's been here since January. So they did that. The question now that they're coming up with was, if it wasn't COVID, it wasn't flu, what was it? Now, some of these we found out is the virus called metanumovirus. So metanumovirus circulates every year. Metanumovirus causes problems in little old ladies and sick little babies. Not very much in between other than just a bad lingering cold. My wife had the same bad lingering cold in December. I don't think it was COVID. But if you want to know, get an antibody test. They're easy. They're cheap. Nothing else. So did I, there's a study suggesting the virus is declining naturally. Yeah, you know, every week there's one of these studies that the virus is declining naturally. I don't think it's true, though. The virus does mutate, and it could mutate into either a stronger form or a weaker form. If it, if it mutates into a weaker form, it might go away. But I don't think that's the case because it's still very active. I mean, there's still eight states with 1,000 cases a day. So if it's declining, I don't think that's the case. I really think it's here for the long run. And I think when we look at these antibody studies, uh, or when we look at these genetic variation studies, sometimes it, it, it sort of wanders off into a less potent path. But some of these actually have gotten a little more potent as they've wandered through. So I think we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I don't think this means we should let down our guard. So can antibody tests be wrong, Monica asked, and the answer is absolutely, positively yes. So I spent, um, so, you know, in my day, I spent all my time reading these articles and going through the FDA sites and whatever, and probably, um, probably look at much more stuff than is healthy. But anyway, today the FDA published the, uh, the accuracy of the antibody tests, and what was stunning on this is that the antibody tests range from really, really accurate. So there were some that were 99% sensitive, meaning that if you had the antibodies, it would find it, and 99% specific, meaning if you didn't have antibodies, it would say you didn't have antibodies. Some, some were 99-99. A test that's 99% sensitive and 99% specific is great. One of the tests was only 80% specific meaning that 20% of the time when you didn't have antibodies, it would say you did. That's a terrible test, since I think only 1% or 2% really have antibodies. Finding antibodies 20% of the time when you didn't have it would suggest that, that most of the results would be wrong. So yes, the antibody test would be wrong. What it did show is that the bench antibody tests, the one that LabCorp uses, the one that Quest uses, the one that Mayo uses, the one that Mount Sinai uses, the one that New York State uses, were really good. They were 98, 99% sensitive and specific. So I wouldn't even waste my time on one of the rapid tests. They're not that expensive. I would just go ahead and do the test from one of the big labs. Um, so David says, is ethnicity or race a variability in susceptibility? 
So clearly race and ethnicity are clearly a factor in getting bad disease. So when we look in most cities, um, people of color uh, and, and, Latina, and Latinx are tremendously overrepresented in hospitalizations and deaths. So a recent study came out in San Francisco that looked at the cases in San Francisco. And although there are, you know, there is a sizable population of whites, uh, Asians, um, blacks, and Latinos in San Francisco, blacks and Latinos were tremendously overrepresented. I don't think this is a susceptibility to disease, but it clearly is a susceptibility for some of the bad things that happen. And so, you know, the black population is so much more likely to have have uh, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity, not related to any genetic predisposition, but just related to years of systemic racism. So I think that's it. So yeah, this is not even. Now, will it ch change susceptibility so that if you do antibody studies, will they have higher levels of antibodies in those populations than others? I do not know the answer to that. So uh, are, am I concerned about how this virus started? I am very concerned about this, how this virus started. I think all of the very best data suggested that this virus started in bats. Bats are nasty little creatures uh, because they fly around a lot. They tend to congregate. Their immune system is very, very, very tolerant of viruses. And because their immune system is tolerant of viruses and because they tend to gather in these huge groups in these caves, they are really good at spreading viruses. I mean, one of the viruses that they spread in the U.S. is rabies. So when we see rabies in the U.S., we think of bad dogs or bad cats or whatever. And it's not really in dogs and cats. It's really in bats. So bats are nasty. And so we think this started in bats and moved to maybe pangolins and then to humans. This is way, way too sophisticated a virus to be made in the human lab. I mean, the human-made viruses are pretty hokey. They are really, you know, they're built on a single backbone. They can usually add one protein to it. If there is a country or a company or somebody who made this virus, they are a thousand years ahead of every other company. So when I think of making a virus, you know, where the human-made viruses are like skateboards, um, this is like a this is like the Star Trek Enterprise. So I don't think this was a human-made virus. Now, it may be that this virus has been studied in other labs around the way because it's very close to the SARS-CoV-1. Uh, this is SARS-CoV-2, so it's kind of related. So you may find it in other labs. But if this is a human-made virus, I, I, I just, it's hard to believe. So, um, so someone says, how long will antibodies stay in your system? Well, we don't know on this one. We do know that some antibodies stay in your system forever. So again, with measles, you get the measles, they're there kind of forever. So that if you, if you have measles when you were five or six years old, which is typically when you had the measles in the past, and you're 97 years old, check the blood, measles antibodies are still there. So some antibodies are very durable, very potent, and that's why you almost never see somebody say, oh, I had the measles twice. You usually only have the measles once. Then there are some things where you make terrible antibodies for it, like HIV, you make antibodies, but they don't seem to help at all. And then other diseases where you make really miserable antibodies, like norovirus, that cruise ship vomiting virus. You make antibodies, they only protect you for a few weeks maybe, and then they go on a cruise the next year, you can get it again. We don't know about this one. What we do know about the other coronaviruses is that you do have antibodies, they do seem to fall off quickly. I think the best that I've heard from this virology guy at, at, at uh, Harvard is they're likely to give you six or nine months protection. That's not very reassuring, right? Because, you'd, you know, I'd get it now, I'd be protected only through Christmas, and then I could get it again. Now, the second time you get it, would it be a milder case? Could be. Well, there are some diseases where... Um, there are some diseases where you get it the second time, it's actually worse. So dengue is a weird disease. When you get it the first time, it's bad. You get it the second time, it's really bad. So we, we don't know about this one. And that's why I don't think we should be counting on antibodies, naturally produced antibodies, to go ahead and give us protection. And it gives me a little bit of pause about the vaccine, because, again, the antibodies may not last. Again, in the Oregon antibody study that was done by Providence, a third of the people who had antibodies at one point 
did not have antibodies a few weeks later. So it did fall off fairly rapidly in that group. So are we, so, um, are we, Zach says, are we closer to a vaccine? And I think, yes, I think every day we're closer to a vaccine. There are 70 vaccines in development. Uh, five of those are starting to enter phase two. And so you go to phase one, phase two, and then you go phase three to see if it works. So I think we're closer to a vaccine. But as we said, we're not sure how long uh, uh, we're not sure how long it lasts and or that it really protects you against the disease. The other issues with the vaccines is that, you know, people are nervous about vaccines that we know a lot about that were developed in typical ways against typical germs. So MMR has been out since the 60s, and still there are a lot of people who don't want the MMR vaccine. HPV has been out since the 90s, and there's still a lot of people who don't want that because of fears. This one is going to be a new vaccine against a new class that's going to be developed quickly. And I worry that people will have real concerns about the safety and may not take it. And so if people don't take the vaccine, it's going to be less likely to be effective. So Phyllis says, does insurance pay for the antibody test if your doctor orders it? Uh, I, I don't know. So with the PCR tests, Congress said, and the governor said, and the president said that nobody will get a test for a, get a bill for a PCR test, and that has pretty much been true. We've not seen anybody who has doctor orders the test get a bill for those. The antibody test was not developed at the time they said this, so we do not know about this. So how soon do you think before PPE is not going to be difficult to come by, Stacy asks. I hope soon, but I really worry about this. So, uh, you know, I talk to people from big hospital systems and they say, well, tell me about your PPE supply. So, you know, in December, everybody had a pretty normal supply of PPE. In January, totally unrelated to this outbreak, there was a big recall of gowns. So people lost a lot of PPE in January because they had to give these gowns back. In January and February, um, the people in this country thought that we weren't going to have a big deal with this. And we exported a tremendous amount of PPE that we made in this country overseas. So I did this talk at the university a few weeks ago. And if you look at the exports of PPE from the United States to other countries, we didn't really export very much in the last years. In January, February of this year, we exported a tremendous amount. So that further depleted the PPE supplies. By March, it was clear that there were going to be problems. And by that time, the other countries that were making it stopped exports to the U.S. I am told now, so that most, most people went January, February, March, April without getting any PPE or very little bit. In May, they're getting similar to the amounts that they got in December. But they're using a lot more because you have to use a lot more PPE when you worry about COVID. And they didn't get anything to make it up. So PPE is still in very, very short supply. I think dentists are doing all kinds of extraordinary things to, to do it. We're working with a group of people to, to make masks and gowns to, to decrease it. But I don't know when we're going to be back to good on this. I would think it... I, as I've said, PPE is going to be one of our tender spots for a long time. And that's one of the reasons I'm worried if we had a second surge. Because if we had a second surge, we would blow through the PPE we have pretty quickly. Now, Mercy's done a very good job of preserving. They've got a good amount of PPE, but certainly not as much as anybody would like. And you just can't find it. So I was at the dentist the other day, and they were talking about how they were reusing their PPE and asking where in the world are they going to find more. And the answer is, I don't know. Um, yeah, so Kat says, are you are using a filter? And yeah, my wife sewed one in. Um, yeah, the pockets are weird because every time you put it up and down, it seems to come out. So my wife sews them into this. Um, so thoughts on convalescent plasma. Will our county work with the Red Cross and local hospitals to have it available here? Yes, and we already have. So we uh, actually, I have to praise Laura, who is our epidemiologist, Early on, when, when our very sick patient needed it, she went through incredible 
battles to go ahead and get the blood taken and do it. In, and he was able to get convalescent plasma, and it may have helped. And, and, after, and she was doing it at a time that it was just being done on a one-off basis. The Red Cross at this point has actually convalescent plasma program. So if you were one of the people who actually had this disease in the county and have antibodies, I would have you contact the Red Cross to see if you could donate your plasma for convalescent plasma. So yeah, so the Red Cross is doing it. And um, so if you, have, if, you, if you can donate, please do it. So Rosanna says, if someone is high risk, should they be out looking for employment? Well, if somebody is high risk, they should be careful. And the best ways to be careful are to socially distance, stay home if you're sick, have the people you're with stay home if they are sick. Um, but, you know, going out looking for employment is a moderate risk activity. You have to travel, presumably, for interviews. You have to be around lots of people. So it is a, you know, it's a, it's certainly not a zero risk activity. And, you know, as we've said before, a lot of things we do go from low risk to high risk. Right, so riding a motorcycle, I think, is is high risk. But in terms of COVID, it's actually, as I said, if I had a year where I was going to do all these high risk things, and turn in my car and ride a motorcycle, pilot a private plane, scuba dive, snorkel, uh, skydive, my risk would still be less than the risk of getting COVID. So. So, you know, when you look at the whole things of the risk, there is a lot of risk for being out in public. And so you have to judge for yourself, is this too high risk or should I just stay home and think out something else? This is going to be really hard. Again, another conference today with people wondering if they should go back to work, for example, if they're older. Uh, should they go back to work if they have an immunosuppressive condition? Should they go back to work if they're battling cancer? And the answer on that is I really don't know. Uh, we think there are going to be a lot of people who decide, look, I'm done. I'm retired. I don't, I, I don't want to put up with this risk. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stay home. And how this plays out, we don't know. There was a study that came out that suggested about one-fifth of teachers feel they're high risk and don't want to be back in the classroom. What will that do? We don't, it's not like we could replace 20% of our teachers easily. So this is a risk. So I, I don't have particularly good advice other than you should probably talk with your doctor and figure out what, depending upon your underlying conditions, your age, what that risk is and do it. But if the risk is, you know, for me, it's 3 or 4%. 3 or 4% is really high. I mean, again, if I had that year of living dangerously, it'd be less than a half a percent. So 3 or 4% is high. I still do it, but I still take a lot of precautions. I have no contacts. So I, I met with a student today, they wanted to do an interview, and we were outside six feet apart, and every time somebody came close, I backed off and put up my mask. So, um, so you have to look at that's for your risk. So somebody said, where are we with places of worship? So places of worship uh, are really important, and I actually had something to do with this. I think places of worship are really important, but we worry about places of worship because places of worship can cause outbreaks. And we know that many of the super spreader events through the world took places and took took place in places of worship. And it's all denominations, you know, the it's been in in uh, in mosques, in temples, in churches. And so we know what happens in those areas because people tend to be close, they tend to be there for a long period of time, and they tend to sing or or chant all things which we in increase the, the aerosol. Where we are now is that uh, churches are going to be considered, considered venues. They're going to be allowed up to, up to the lesser of 250 or 35 square feet per person. So if you were in a very small church uh, that was 1,000 square feet, you could have 30 or so. If you were in a very large church, you could have more, but not more than 250. So I work with Redeemers this week about that. And it's, it looks like they're going to be able to get 150 to 200 people there. So Ryan says, what will guidance change on self-served food, frozen yogurt? Self-served foods is going to be a problem. Um, because self-served food means that people who may have bad habits are touching things. 
And so self-serve food is not coming back in phase two. I'm not sure it'll ever come back. You know, people talk about things that'll never come back. Um, I'm not sure that self-serve food in buffets will ever come back, but I don't know. But they're not back yet. So it's safe for children to have doctor's appointment in the hospital if they have an active case. Uh, yeah, I think if your kids are, are, are sick, they should be seen in the hospital. Um, doctor's offices are, should be relatively low risk events. Uh, again, your doctor's offices should not have big crowded waiting rooms. They should have plenty of, of movement there. You shouldn't be crowded in any place. Uh, people at medical facilities should be wearing masks, so they are relatively safe. So David says, what did Japan do right? Wow. So Japan is interesting. So Japan did not do a, a ton of testing. They did some testing. They, they had a very early closure of group activities, and that helped. The other thing that, the other different, I lived in Japan for a while, and I just love living in Japan. A couple of things happened. One is, even 20 years ago, I was there in the 80s, almost 40 years ago, uh, they all wore masks. So it was very, very common for people back then to wear masks. So mask wearing was very common and continued to be common. That might be one of the things that they did. They, almost everybody in Japan wears glasses, and some for just cosmetic reasons. So glasses, we think, also decreases spread. And the Japanese don't have lots of big congregation events. Um, sort of going to a big church in Japan was, at least in the parts of Japan I was, was not a thing. And going to big crowded places was really not a thing in Japan. So it may be that their lack of crowding in uh, events, it may be that their use of masks and their use of eyeglasses did it right, or they might just have been lucky. So. You know, people say, why has Douglas County done so great? And I say it's because we have a great public health team, which we do. But I don't think it's just that. I think we just have not had any super spreader events. And Japan had very few super spreader events. And whether that was just luck or something else, we don't know. Um, but that's it. So is it possible to put the ages of our 29 positives? Uh, sure. Um, they range from 40 to 80, 40s to 80s. Like most of the cases, they range from the 40s to 80s. I think we have a couple of cases in the 40s, but a couple in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and some in the 80s. So that's the group. We don't have anybody in there. We don't have anybody who's a Douglas County case who's younger. Now, there are positive cases. So this is one of the things I want to explain. There are, so it, when you have a case, it's, your, it's from your county of residence. So I live in Douglas County. If I would happen to be sick and be seen at a hospital in Eugene, I might be in Eugene when I had the case, but it would come back to Douglas County. Similarly, if somebody was from California and they came to Oregon and were tested and had a positive case in Oregon, their case would be from California, although they still might be in Oregon. So it's a little confusing, but you have to do it one way or another. You have to either do it by the county of diagnosis or by the county of residence, and public health has traditionally done it by the county of residence. Can we get a better breakdown of positive cases by zip code other than one to nine? No. So the Oregon Health Authority has asked us to do the one to nine, and we do it. I know some counties have done it, but again, it's not knowing the data, it wouldn't be very helpful. Um, so what will phase three look like? So phase three is going to be when we have a very effective therapeutic, that is the antiviral drug. When you get it, you take it, and it becomes a mild illness or an effective vaccine. So phase three is not gonna be for a long time. So phase three, these phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, was part of the CDC phasing. I thought actually that the distance between phase one and phase two is not very big, but the difference between phase two and phase three is enormous. So I think what we're gonna see is phase 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, because we're gonna to have to figure out how to reopen schools. We might figure out how to reopen sports. We might figure out how to reopen other venues. So I think we're gonna get little changes along the way, but phase three won't be until we have either an effective therapeutic or an effective vaccine. And people ask me all the time to predict when. Well, there's this really famous guy who says it's gonna happen on July 12, 2021. And they say, how could you be so, so accurate? The answer is he's not. I just had a guess, and so he picked uh, July 2021. 
And so he's really smart. He's probably one of the smartest people in the world on this. So I would think he's probably right that if there's going to be something, it'll be July 2021. Now, there's some people suggesting it may even be longer than that. So I read another very smart guy today, and his suggestion was it could be longer than that because the sense is that vaccine development and and getting a vaccine that works and knowing that it works is going to take a lot longer than this fall. And so that his thought was that the earliest that you could really have a vaccine was where Dr. Fauci said back in March was a year from March. And then his sense is that if you got a year from March, it would take a while to do it. His thought is that this is likely going to be a multi-dose vaccine. So you're likely going to have to have three dose, two or three doses of the vaccine. And two or three doses of the vaccine was going to be till next summer. Uh, and so we don't know what it's going to be. It's possible that somebody hits on an antiviral that will work. There is so much work on the antiviral, and nobody's come up with anything great so far. So it's a little bit worrisome that we're going to have something really quick. Okay, so uh, that's what we got. Um, one of the things that I want to point out is that there is a new antigen test. So when we talk about, so we're going to try and confuse people a lot. So we started off first with the PCR test, and the PCR test is the one that you do from the nasal swab. It looks for the genetic material from the virus. It is very accurate if it's positive, not particularly accurate if it's negative, very complicated and somewhat expensive to do. And some of the parts along the way, the viral transport media, some of the primers are in short supply. The second test we had was an antibody test, was the blood test. And that doesn't tell you if you have the infection now, but could tell you if you've had the infection in the past. As we've noted, some of the tests came out were not very high quality. The FDA pulled back. There are some out there that are very high quality that we can use. The new test that's out is an antigen test. Again, this one uses a nasal swab and doesn't look for the nucleic acid that's in the protein in the virus. It looks for the proteins in the virus. This is similar to the test we do for straps, similar to the test we do for flu. And the good news on this is these are relatively quick to use. They're relatively inexpensive. And in this case, is very specific, meaning if your test is positive, you definitely have it. It is not very sensitive, maybe only, only 50 or 60% sensitive. So having a negative test doesn't rule it out, but having a positive test is really good evidence that you have the disease. And so we're excited to see this new antigen test call. It's also called the Kydel test. So if you hear about this, we'll see. And I think we'll see more in there. We're still up on the hotline, 541-464-6550. That's 541-464-6550. Our people who answer that know a lot about the new phase two guidelines, but they are really complicated. So please don't rely on them for the legal definition. So for example, there was a question today about, uh, so I was on one of these conferences today, about ax throwing and where ax throwing fits in. You're starting to get really very specific when you talk about ax throwing venues about what goes on. So that's what we got. Okay, well, thank, thank you everybody for doing this. We'll try and again continue to do this on Mondays and Fridays. If you have questions that you thought about or didn't get to, send them to us and we'll research the answers and get them there. If there's things that I got wrong, and I don't think I did, but uh, I usually go through these again. And if I did said something wrong, I will correct it. But again, social distancing, stay home if you're sick and be kind. Uh, I think people in Oregon have been incredible with this and thank you.